hey leaders, it's your cheer leader here. And I wanted to start this episode by giving a huge thank you to those who have been tuning in every week, subscribing to iTunes, and leaving us a review. You have no idea how helpful that is in helping other future failed it leaders find us. That is a tongue twister. But I wanted to read one of the reviews we received recently from Fow Fow. So Fow Fow writes, legit, the guests thus far are amazing, which is huge, but you ask some questions that make them even more awesome. You get them out of the canned corporate speak response. I'm just constantly impressed by you and proud of you. I get so many great directives and action items with each episode, and it's all so applicable with the advice given. Each episode gets my wheels turning, and I love it. It makes me excited to identify my fails. Foul, foul, yes. Identify those fails, and then I want you to realize how far you've stinking come. And know that canned corporate speak is not allowed here, and I'm so glad you called that out. So you, foul, foul, are totally failing it, and I'm so grateful for you for listening in. So leaders... If you enjoyed today's episode, I want to encourage you to go over to iTunes, rate us, and give us a review. I'll be reading reviews here, and I want to give you a big fail yeah. So foul, foul, fail yeah. And know that there are more action items that come in to keep your wheels a spinning. I see you, and I will keep on making this jazz with you in mind. So one caveat before we dive into today's episode is that I recorded today's episode with Josh Johnson back in February before the pandemic was happening. So there's no mention of coronavirus or what's going on today because it had not yet happened. This was supposed to be our very first episode on the Failed It podcast that we launched with, but due to the pandemic, we pushed it back just to give you what you needed right then. So Look at us trying to be proactive and productive, and then a pandemic hits, and all poop hits the wall, and we pivot. It's the name of the game or the podcast. Am I right or am I right? So, with fail, my friends, let's get into the episode with the one and only Josh Johnson. I promise you are going to love this. Let's do it. Hey there, my name is Erin Deal, and I'm a half Southern, half Midwestern mama, some call this voice a nasal twang, who took $5,000 to build and scale a one of a kind experiential organization that improves the lives of corporate professionals through personal development, humanity, and humor. Along the way, I've built client relationships with some of the most notable companies in the country, all while attracting a rock star team of experts and hilarious facilitators. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Well, what I didn't tell you is that my resume also includes a long list of comedy shows I bombed, improv teams I didn't make, companies who told me no, and many a heartache when it came to becoming a mother. I want to show you the real deal of the grit, creativity, and determination it takes to overcome your disappointments, embrace the suck, and design the career you could only dream about. I believe we all have our own unique gifts that we bring to the world, and it is our mistakes that help to unwrap them. Welcome to Failed It. Welcome to the Failed It podcast, the show that reminds you, you have to fail in order to improve. I'm Erin Deal, the founder of Improve It and your host, and we're here with the one, the only, the real Josh Johnson. Now, here's the real deal on the real Josh Johnson. So he is a stand-up He's a writer and a performer from Louisiana by way of Chicago. He is currently a writer on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, and he's been featured on Kevin Hart's Heart of the City. Josh was named one of Comedy Central's Comics to Watch in 2015 and one of the Just for Laughs Festival's New Faces in 2016. He is a former writer and performer on The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon, where he also made his late night stand-up debut in 2017. As a stand-up, Josh has performed at clubs, colleges, and festivals around the world, including JFL Montreal, Bumbershoot, Moon Tower, South by Southwest, Riot LA, Bridgetown, High Plains, and the New York Comedy Festival. He was named Caroline's New York's Funniest Comic in 2018. Now, on screen, Josh has appeared on Conan at Midnight with Chris Hardwick, and in 2017, he released his Comedy Central half-hour special and album, I Like You. 
His web series, Genies, which he wrote and starred in, was released on Comedy Central in late 2018. Now, Josh's stand-up special as part of the comedy lineup was released on Netflix in 2018. He is currently on the road with his boss, Trevor Noah, as part of the Loud and Clear tour. So Josh lives in New York and can be seen performing regularly at the Comedy Cellar. Welcome, Mr. Josh Johnson. Hey, how's it going? Good. I'm so excited to chat with you, and I'm so honored that you are our very first guest on the Failed It podcast. I just want to give our listeners a little bit of background on you and I. So Josh and I met um, at The Annoyance in probably 2011 or 12, which is a a theater here in Chicago. We did level like two together. Is that right? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. And I mean, this guy, we were friends. We hit it off. Then he just pounded the pavement, pounded. I shouldn't say the pavement, but you were after it and just did so many open mics and just started crushing it in the comedy world. And it has been such a pleasure to watch you from a distance, like a proud stage mom. So congratulations, first of all, on all of the success. And we are just so happy to have you here. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I will even say I was, we, before we started recording, I started talking to Josh about um, back before this lovely bio I just read, my dad had you come out to California for a conference he was running. And this is prior to you being on any type of television show, but you did a comedy or you did a stand up set for them and crushed it. And um, then they started seeing you on television. So you made Fred Holbrook look really good. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, Fred and dad, if you're listening, you're welcome. So, <laughs> Um, so I love that I just listed your bio of all these amazing, successful things that you've done. I would love to know your failure resume. So I want you to tell us if you can, in, in any length that you want, how you got to where you are, but not through the successful stories, through the journey and the real test of that testimony, if you will, to get you where you are today. I think presently like writing at daily show came from not getting a correspondent slot on the opposition with jordan klepper i don't know if you remember that show it was a yeah. Comedy Central show uh, that was slotted right after daily show and i had actually auditioned to be a correspondent on the show and didn't get it but uh, the producers liked my writing for because to to audition you had to write a piece and you had to perform a piece that was pre-written and they really liked my written piece. So they were like, you should do a daily show packet. And, and so I did, and then ended up getting the job at daily show through it. Like that was one of the, you know, many things that fell into place to make that happen. And I think honestly, if I had, I don't know where I would be if I had done that and got it, um, and not actually been, passed over for it like it was a bit of a blessing in disguise you know because it's led to so much more than just the one thing that was in front of me totally no and i want to know too because i remember back at our time together um in our class at the annoyance like you would just you worked as a grocer am i right at trader joe's did i make that up no no you did not make that up uh i I was first a grocer at aldi which was yeah with Oh man. And then I moved to Trader Joe's like a very lateral move. Um, but it actually ended up being amazing because Trader Joe's worked with my schedule way more. So then I was able to do shows at night. And when I finally got past at some of these clubs, I was able to give them spot times and everything. Whereas Mm -hmm. when I worked at Aldi, it was like, I was just there all the time, different hours every, every other day. So you did not make that up. That was (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was very much a part of my life, um, working at Trader Joe's. Yeah. Well, but then I remember, and this is why I'm just so blown away by you, because I remember you, because I remember you always had on like the sweatshirt, right? Like the Aldi sweatshirt. And you were like, yeah, I just, I came from work and we would go to class. And then you would do, you would just do open mics after open mic. Tell people how many open mics that you had to do how many bombs that you had to do? What like were there times that you actually bombed? Because when I hear you, I've never truly 
when we played together, I've never seen you not be funny. So does Josh Johnson bomb? Uh, you're actually very kind. I have bombed. Uh, it, I, there's not a number. There's genuinely not. It's like the, when you're, especially the way that open mics work for stand up is already not conducive with anyone having a good time or any actual <laughs> comedy happening. It's like, it would be like if you had to do all the jokes that you do, whether they work or not, whether you're trying things out or you're just, you know, doing like stuff that you know is funny. It's like doing it in front of a firing squad because you're not doing it for an audience. You're doing it for people who are also waiting to get up and do their thing. So you already don't have the most supportive crowd. And and then on top of that, what you're saying may very well not be funny. So then you're just doubly uh, screwed if you <laughs> showed up looking for any sort of encouragement. Uh, oh. it, it was like, I mean, I also like was not, I don't think I can say that I was like good for the first year and a half. Like I, I would have ideas that would maybe go to an interesting place, but they didn't, they didn't track or I wasn't doing a good enough job of explaining myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so like, and especially if you're, if you're going to be in any ways like provocative, or if you're trying to like say something that makes people think about things in a different way, you have to already be ahead of them. So if you're figuring it out in front of them, it's just, it's both uncomfortable to watch and it's rarely funny. Uh -huh. Um, so I think that that was what led to me having such like terrible shows and like, you know, they were, they were hit and miss like that first year is just like because you're also figuring out how you are in front of people, like how you get comfortable and what you want to talk about and, and everything like that. You're so focused on yourself. You're like almost not even in a world of really, you think you're thinking about material and like takes and, and vision and voice and stuff, but you're really not. You're just in your own head for the most part. And I think that people can see that and, and feed off that. So then it's just harder for you to, both have a good time and people have a good time watching you. Yeah. So I would have great shows, but the majority of that first year and a half was like, it was also bad because I knew what was good. If that makes sense. I knew that one day doing well would feel different than how I felt right now, even if it didn't go bad. Cause there would be times where I didn't bomb, but I would be like, Oh, that wasn't good though. Yeah. So, okay, let me ask you this. So the, you moved to Chicago from Louisiana, right? You started doing improv class in open mics, working at Aldi's then Trader Joe. And then what happened from there? Because I actually remember, Josh, do you remember you and I doing a podcast at Laugh Factory? It was your podcast. Yeah. And I remember, I can't remember the title. Because I think before you even launched that, you got you flew off to New York and you won that award. Am I right? Am I making stuff up? Yeah, you're okay. So you have a better memory than you give yourself credit for. <laughs> the The podcast was actually a, a true failure. So you were one of four people I interviewed, and I actually I was very proud of myself that I was able to get interesting people. But then I had these great episodes. And I had four of them, and then. It was, I had a different manager at the time as well. And so it, it ended up where I don't know if I misunderstood him. I don't, I don't know what was happening, but from what I was told, if I had recorded a few episodes already, we could then take that to a company that was building up a podcast network, like let's say MTV or something. Because at the time, I think in like 2013, 2014, MTV was like just getting into like, maybe we'll do a podcast arm of our, you know, our entertainment and everything. And so my manager was like, that'd be a good time to get them in on an idea that you are, you know? And so then I had all these great guests on, we had these great conversations and then I told him about it. And I don't know if he forgot, I don't know what happened, but he was like, <laughs> Oh, I don't know if I ever said that. And I'm like, there's no way. Like, I got four weeks worth of guests. There's no way that. And then I was like, well, what if I make a sizzle or a sample? And he's like, I guess I, and it just, it felt, I felt crazy. Cause I was like, there's no way that I had four weeks of guests and like all these like hour long episodes for nothing off of like 
something I misinterpreted. And and so then I, I at the time I like just gaslit myself and I was like, maybe I misunderstood him. Maybe this was all like in my head. So I may very well still have all four of those recordings, but <laughs> I have not put the podcast into gear. And that feels like a true mistake. No. Well, you know what? This is the name of our podcast. We're, we're talking about the failures, right? And it's not because I when I think of you, like I've known you and watched you grow, right? And so when I think of you, I think only of that bio I just read. Like I think of that. And to hear you say these things, it's nice. It's a nice reminder for people who want to be like you or who want to grow in their career in some way, shape or form, because it is so hard. The things that you have done, that list I rattled off is not easy. There are so many things that you have done along the way that I think even, you know, you, you tend to forget about because, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it seems like the highs outweigh the lows, but the lows are really the drivers to get you to the next thing. So what door opened then from that podcast not becoming a real thing? I will say, and this is part of the confusion. I think this is part of what happened. So the podcast idea was also an idea for a TV show. So I went to MTV and I pitched that TV show and obviously it did not get off because it's not part of my bio. But it led to a meeting with the people who, I mean, some of them are still at MTV and then some of them have since left and now they're in other at like other forms of media and other channels and just doing different jobs. And and I made a decent enough impression on that meeting that now it, it, it has spread. It, it kept an impression on the people that now, even though they're in different uh, aspects and fields of entertainment, that they still like kept me in mind for things. And, you know, it hasn't like, it hasn't materialized in a way that I can just trace the dots right back to that moment. But like everything is something, you know? So I, I, I am glad that I took the opportunity seriously and the pitch seriously. And even if I completely misconstrued what my manager at the time meant by podcast, I think that it, it all led to um, me also being a little bit better on podcasts. Like, at the time when I had recorded you and three of my other friends, I wasn't that great of an interviewer. I wasn't that great of even like a po- podcast guest. And I'm still like learning things like in the middle of your story. This this happens a lot where in the middle of a story that you're telling, you realize like, oh, no one cares about this. Like there's no way that this like anyone who is listening to this and, and driving in the middle of my story, they're like, what is he talking about? So I'm, I'm better at catching that now. Whereas when I was using those recordings for practice, I had no idea what people would care about or what they wouldn't, you know? So I, I think in those ways, it's helped me, um, going forward, you know, like it, it's, it's less about me using that particular instance as like a building block towards something else. And me just like, taking the overall experience from it and and accepting that it made me a little bit better at a thing that I do fairly often. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this too. So once you got into those meetings and things started really happening for you, was there any failure through that list of things that I just rattled off? Or are there things that we don't see in between the Tonight Show? And I know you mentioned you were going to to try to be on this show as a, a correspondent and that didn't work out. But is there anything that you can think of later in your career that was really a turning point for you that was, was hard to go through, but led you to somewhere else? I So with the Comedy Central half hour, I had actually applied to do it a year before I actually got it. So that first year I sent in my half hour and I got like a, he's still cooking. It's not ready sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was like, devastated really isn't even the right word. I was more like disappointed because I really thought I was ready. And I felt like, you know, the, in the class of people who did their half hours that year, I definitely felt like I was in that class. And, and that even though a lot of the people were a couple years ahead of me doing comedy, I felt like, oh man, I'm just as good as them, everything. And then it just, it, it uh, taught me to like 
not rest on what I think the next thing is and just keep making things like there's a story. I don't know if this is true or not, but there's a, there's a story about Quentin Tarantino that when he finally got the green light for Reservoir Dogs, like basically when he was making Reservoir Dogs and it was catching on and everyone was falling in love with it and everything, he had already written his next two scripts. So I think he had he had already written the next two movies that would come out. Now, I don't know if that's like true or if that's like Hollywood folklore, but that that really stuck with me because in the time, I think that there are plenty of people who apply for the half hour and didn't get it. And then the next year sent in like a similar ha- same half hour and hope they would get it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then in that time, I was almost beyond the half hour and was like, ready to do my hour somewhere and really wanted to shop that. And so even in the, even though the rejection can set you back or can like seem like a pitfall, you, if you keep making things as if you had already got the thing. So basically I just kept writing and I kept doing shows and I kept building on like the, the, like, I guess you can say quote unquote vault that I had going as if I did already have the half hour. And so I took the material that I thought was good enough already and i was like i just won't send it in again and i'll just keep that and then that's some some of that material is what ended up being like the netflix stuff and then some of it is what ended up being like on fallon and and so like everything had had a place i just had to put it in i had to plug it in in a way that worked for me and didn't necessarily work for the for like any sort of gatekeeper or you know anyone that was judging the the place that they thought that my like material and stage presence all that stuff the place that they thought that i was at so i think that if anyone is is in that situation where you've gotten like a a rejection or a no or anything i i think that if you just proceed like it was a yes you're you're always going to be better off than if you wait or if you sort of regroup to try to get another you know yes somewhere else you know Yeah. I love that. I love that. Cause it's almost like you were affirming to yourself. I already have this and you believed that you had it. And then you were just building and building, which I think leads me to my next question. So thank you so much for that. Um, let me ask you this, and this could even be one of these three. So I'm going to ask you, what are three lessons that you learned when you failed it? Or you had these failures that we've discussed. What are the three big takeaways? that you learned? Um, I, I mean, I think I definitely, you know, I need to make a point to make it clear that like along the way, and I, I don't, you know, I don't want to take all the credit for this. Cause I think that some people are just genuine and great people and everything. A lot of people, including you have been very nice to me. So like, <laughs> I can't, I can't pretend <laughs> that I'm just like so great that everyone gravitates towards me or something like people are genuinely good to me. And I try to be good to other people and everything. So a lot of the failures that I've had may not seem, I think that because they were personally like heartbreaking at the time, they may not seem so deeply impactful. Like there are people like, you know, Kanye or something that was actually told by people to stop or to quit or to, you know what I mean? Or he was better yeah. at this than this. And, and I haven't had that so much as I've had a lot of like polite no's, a lot of, you know, like doors don't really get slammed in my face, but they do get closed pretty slowly, you know? Like, <laughs> like and, and so I think that my main takeaway is, you know, is there's something about both being like patient and persistent that are, that are going to be, hard to beat if you build up those two qualities because if you understand that like the thing's going to come eventually but also i'm going to proceed as if the next the next time i encounter someone it's going to be a yes i think that no matter what you're doing whether it's like entertainment or any field that you're in you're going to um be met with success i mean that that is expressly how people get funding how they you know you just on a long enough timeline, you ask enough people, you're going to get enough yeses to make you successful, you know? And, and then the other one is that, um, it's important to be flexible because I think that some people are so, I, I love when people have dreams and I am a personal believer in dreams and everything, but 
I think that some people get so attached to the dream the way they've envisioned it that then mm-hmm. anything that goes wrong or anything that's a setback sort of snaps them in half. And I think that if you're able to be flexible, um, you open yourself up to all possibilities of getting to the place that you eventually want to be. And mm-hmm. then, and then I do think that like, you know, as corny as it may sound, I do think that like dreams come true and everything, but you just don't see the design, you know, like it's, it's very important to plan. You know, I, I am always big on sitting down and just planning out a year, planning out the next six months, planning out, you know, how I want to do certain things and everything. But, you know, you have to, you have to be adaptable or else it's, it's all going to leave you behind, you know, like, in especially in, in things like, entertainment and in business it's like you you know you can always connect the dots looking back but like you, there were there was a time where uber was coming up and you know yellow cabs were like no we're good we're yellow cabs we're always going to be around we're always going to be top dog and then they got they got slipped on in the middle of the night you know everyone's mm-hmm. taking uber everyone's and so now their business model just doesn't work anymore and you know the only people they have lifting them up are the people that are indebted to them and I think that a lot of people do that with their own like personal goals and everything where they're like, oh, you know, things are going well. I, I can't really uh, see any way that I'll fail or get set back. Everyone's coming to me. Every- it's like, yeah, but none of that is forever. You have to, you have to stay ever changing. Oh my God. I love that. And it's so true because in entertainment and in business, I mean, that is one thing that we always talk about, if you're not seeing things differently, and if you're not evolving and changing, then your competition is going to surpass you. And that's, I think the name of every game is just staying on top of it. I love that. And by the way, I want to go back to one thing you said. The reason people are so nice to you, Mr. Josh Johnson, is because you put out the best energy ever. You're one of the nicest people you always have been. So I'm a firm believer in what you give, you receive. So that's why those those doors have opened and have closed shut very slowly because you're a good guy. Oh, yeah. I mean, and my mom prays for me a lot. So maybe that has something to do with it. Thank God for moms. Am I right? Am I right? Also, we're going to have a sidebar conversation about what you did. So I'm, I'm a new mom, obviously, and I have a son. So I'm always asking boys, what, what did your mom do to get you to love her that much. So that's another podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Hey friends, I wanted to pause really quick and tell you about something we have coming up at Improve It. Now it's called Improve It's WFH Workshop From Home Membership. We hope you can join us. So as a member, we have an awesome arrangement of things that will help you navigate this remote environment and improve yourself both personally and professionally. So as a WFH member, you will receive one live interactive virtual workshop with your fellow community members to help you navigate remote work, an automatic ticket to our weekly live virtual webinars, or a recording to watch it whenever works best for you, a three-week DIY that's do-it-yourself e-learning course that's built in conjunction with the monthly workshop, and an online community, including a private Facebook group where you will receive live weekly mini coaching sessions with yours truly, laugh and lunch events with our hilarious improv professionals, and an exclusive weekly newsletter to members that gives you all the weekly deets. So we are offering all of this for the low price of $19.99. Let me say it again for the people in the back, $19.99. So a portion of every purchase will be donated to our charity partners, Girl Forward and Girls Rock Charlotte to support their programs during this challenging time. The last date to sign up for our June cohort is May 31st at 11.59 p.m. So you'll find the link to sign up in our show notes. We can't wait to laugh and learn with you. I'll see you there. Okay, back to you. So at Improve It, I'm not sure if you know this, but we use a chicken hat in our workshops. It's a real thing. It's a hat with legs and the chicken has legs with sneakers on it. And people hear this and they think, oh my God, it's so cheesy. But we use it for a variety of ways because truly... Anytime in our workshop, somebody says the word improv, we pass the chicken hat to the person on the right. 
And then we do literally the chicken dance. And what it does is it sets the tone in the upfront of the workshop that we're all going to be on the same page, that together we're going to guide ourselves out of our comfort zones. We're going to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. So what would you say, now that you know what the chicken hat is, what would you say your chicken champion moment is or what was your most important lesson out of all these things that you just mentioned that you learned by becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable? What would you say the one chicken champion moment was for you? The thing that makes this tough is that I would like to think that it hasn't happened yet. You know what I mean? Like, like just mm-hmm. that it that maybe that lesson is like on the way in a good way. Uh, but I do think that coming up and not having, <laughs> I th- it okay. This is gonna sound weird, but I do think being poor does a lot for you. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's not weird. I'm not saying I was even the poorest of the poor. I'm just saying like from a young age, knowing that there are things that you have and then there's everything else that you can't have is like, it just sets up a dynamic in your mind that like gets you kickstarted in a way that when you're, and I'm not even saying, obviously everyone wants to do the best by their family and by their kids and everything. So I just think that a byproduct of being given so much, especially when it's with love and everything, can sort of set you up for not understanding that the world isn't that way. Mm -hmm. I'll give you just a quick example is that my mom, my mom, my aunt, my grandpa, my grandma all pooled their money together when I was a little kid um, to send me to a Montessori school, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. then a lot of people also don't know that I like you associate the like any sort of private school or anything else with like coming from means or something like that. But it's like, honestly, if I would have had a brother, I wouldn't have been able to like do any of these things, you know, like it was only because I was the first baby in like 10 years. And because I had this immediate family pooling their money together to help me out that I was able to get some of the opportunities that I got. So then it put me at a place where when I was you know, at home or struggling or, or anything, I could see people who weren't. And just by, by nature of like the accident of birth, you know what I mean? So it wasn't even anyone's fault. It was just like, oh, okay, this is how, this is how the world is. Like, I'm gonna, for whatever reason, have to work a little bit harder to get the same as someone else. And, and I think that having it from a very young age made it feel less unfair because it just felt normal. and. I think that's helped me a lot because now you'll see people, especially among comedians who are like, why did this person get a special? Why did this person is doing this, this, and this? And it's like, I mean, maybe that's just their, their path or, or people just gravitate towards them for some reason. And, you know, you, you have to treat things like your time is going to come, you know, like, I, I think that we're in a particular position of, of fortune and basically, everyone who's not an athlete has um, a very advantageous setup where you only get better with time. Your body, since you're not dependent on it to do the thing that you love, isn't withering away and you're not running out of chances. Like if I wanted to be a pro football player, I would have already failed, you know, or mm-hmm. if I wanted to go to the Olympics, it's like time's already up. But because the thing that I'm trying to do both takes time because it takes time for me to live a life that people find interesting and want to hear more about. And it takes time for me to have general takes and opinions on the things that I come across. I'm only getting better as I get older. Whereas I think other people are in a situation where they have a particular dream and they just weren't blessed with the natural talents it takes to accomplish it, like talking about sports again. And I think that Everyone else, just about everyone, no matter what their dream is, is in a position where time only builds and helps them get to where they want to go. I love that. I love that. And I think, too, I mean, you speaking of just knowing that you had to work a little bit harder. I remember you saying that. I, I, I get I'm being nice to you, but it's the things that I see that I've watched you do. I think I've never seen anybody be so diligent and consistent and you constantly went to open mic after open mic early in your career and just started working so hard. So I think 
that has served you well in your career too. The fact that you have had to, I'm the same way. I mean, truly, I feel like I am not the world's best improviser by any means. I just love it and have a passion for it. And I'll outwork anybody in a room, right? Like I'm, I'm dedicated to working and putting in the work. And I think that's a wonderful thing, an attribute to have that will take you places with time. So I love that. Okay. So this is something I want you to, to think about. If you had three action items for others to improve themselves. So again, we say in improv, there are no mistakes, only gifts. So what are your three action items for others to improve themselves based on learning from your gifts, right? Because they're not, they're not failures. We're going to call them gifts. So what would you say for anybody listening, what are three action items that they could take based on learning from what you've gone through? I think that this is almost impossible because uh, just because of the way that our brains work and, and the, the way that the world is and everything. But I'd, I'd say if you can strive to be as close as you can to like actual objectivity, like if you, if you can look at things objectively and yourself objectively, you're just going to have, you're going to have a better life and you're going to be better at whatever it is you want to do. I think a lot of, there's a lot of denial and a lot of like biases that come into play. And, and I think that like, you know, it, it, it it becomes difficult to even help people if you can't accurately look at them or like look at yourself or anything. And, and so I, I think number one is to be as objective as possible. I guess two would to, this is going to sound weird, but I think it, it not necessarily fasting in a, in a religious sense, but I think it's important for everyone, no matter who you are to go hungry for a day once in a while. Cause mm. then you just, it changes so much about you in one day because you know you'll you'll see that like a lot of a lot of the way that the world is doesn't make sense to someone who is at least all right and if you could do one thing that isn't necessarily affecting your health terribly or anything that puts you in a position to understand other people that are coming from that place that can't get out of it i think that you would be able to understand them better and so I think that, you know, people talk about, especially when it comes to dreams, goals, whatever, like being hungry and everything. But I think if you, if you actually are like genuinely hungry for an entire day and you just have to go through your day and no one else knows that you're hungry and no one else knows what you're, what you're doing or going through or anything, it puts you in a mindset that like connects you with more of the world than you think it would. And then I think number three, I guess just like read more, um, it, I'm also trying to read more and I'm trying to pick good books that I both find interesting and might help me along um, being like a more well-rounded person and everything. But I think that reading is a lot like exercising where uh, some people just think that it's not for them or they don't do it for fun or they, they and I, there are actually more types of books out there than there are exercises. So I think that if you find something, you'll find a thing that you enjoy that also helps you see the world in a different light, you know? Okay. Well, I'm putting all three of these to practice. First of all, my mind just was blown by the hunger. Like you just so eloquently put that into words. If you want to be hungry for something, feel the way that the world feels and feel, put yourself, it's essentially empathy. You're, you're empathizing, but you're doing it and seeing the world in a different way. And I just can't tell you how much that resonated with me. And I think, will probably resonate with a lot of people listening to this. So freaking love that, Josh Johnson. Yes, thank you for sharing and food for thought, literally. I want to ask you a deep question. We're going deep. So we're called Improve It, right? That's the name of the company that I, I, I'm a founder of. And the it is actually whatever you want it to be. But it could be your life. It could be your improve your life, improve your career, improve whatever it is. So after learning from all of your gifts or your failures, what is your it? Or if you want to call it, what is your life's purpose? I think that mostly maybe be here to make it a little bit easier for other people to be here. I don't know. Life life is like needlessly hard. There's a lot of parts of life that are difficult and we don't know why and we don't really know how to make them better. And so, you know, I, I think that if I if I wasn't so queasy, I'd be a doctor. Or if I was like <laughs> a little bit better at math, maybe I would do 
something that can help stuff. people. Yeah, just yeah. whatever math stuff. I know so little about math. I didn't know other math words. Yeah, me neither. To describe knowing math. But I think that this is the things that I do right now are like my ways of, of helping people. And, and I try to, you know, whenever possible, make it not necessarily about enriching myself or like trying to get more popular or anything and just do something that makes it a little bit easier to like be here. I think I think a lot of people don't feel good being around as vague as that sounds. I think that a lot of people carry so much of all day and like through their own life on things they feel like they can't talk to people about things that they and if and I think if I had more of an and an acumen for for the way that people think or or like if I could understand or wrap my head around more psychology then maybe I would do some sort of like therapy for people or something but I found that in all the things that I've tried this is this trying to make people laugh is the thing that I've turned out to be the best at and so it's the thing that I put all my energy towards and it's the thing that I think I can use to help to make the world a better place is such a uh, vague sort of description but it's not, it's not some sort of like tiny effort that I'm putting out there it's like I want to help people understand money and understand health and 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 also laugh and everything I think that those those things are so much a part of what people are struggling with that I think that if I were to be able to help them with one or all three I think that I'd be helping improve some people's lives and then being here for me at least would have like a deeper, more important purpose than just like doing stand up. Cause a lot of, a lot of what doing stand up is, is just the sort of stroking your ego in front of people, uh, unless you use it towards an end that makes something better for someone else, you know, like whether it's their night or their date or their whatever that thing is. I, I get a lot of messages that make me very happy where people are like, oh, I'm, actually going through a rough time and I like watching your videos because it's just light. This is like sort of lighthearted fun and, and it won't always be. I think that there's going to be times where I, I delve into something that's like a bit darker, but I'm not necessarily doing it for like any sort of shock value or anything. I, I more want to do it to also cover the, the idea and the fact that life isn't just like quirky observations through and through, you know? Yeah. I love that. And I do think there is something so special about that, that you, you are helping people want to be here. Like, I think that, and if I'm summing up what you just said, it's you're helping people find happiness and being alive. So kudos, my man. I got another question for you. Yeah. What did you fail at today? It's early in the morning when we're recording this, not early, but I guess for you, it's Eastern time. So it's like lunch. What? So you've just had from now until lunch. What did you fail at today? Man, I tried to work out today and I did work <laughs> out today. Like I did it. I didn't just try. I did do it, but woof. If I, <laughs> so basically I am in a situation where, you know, because of the tour and because of just different aspects of like trying to balance all the things that I have going on, not even professionally, just like spend time with my girlfriend, read. I was doing jujitsu for a little while and had to like put it on hold because there was just no time. I haven't been the most consistent with working out. So then, you know, every workout is supposed to progress from the last one, like a little bit, just like slightly more intense than the last one. And because I hadn't worked out properly in a full week, I just, I could not get with it. It was, it was rough. It was like, it was like genuinely like my trainer and I were just sort of perplexed because I didn't know how to like, I just didn't know how to make anything work. Like it, it was like, I was learning how to do all the exercises over again. And so I was just like sort of a sweaty mess and my <laughs> eyes were half open and I was tired because I don't always work out in the morning, but yeah, it was pretty bad. Okay. Well, I'm proud of you. You're, you're totally failing it right now. Okay. Yeah. So that was good. That was good. So this is, we're getting to the end. This is something that I'm going to surprise you with here. Okay. It's called fail. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and this is a lightning round. 
And so we're mixing in a little improv here and thinking quickly on your feet. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and then I want you to respond as fast as you can with only one word. Okay. So no, again, you can't fail, but if you say more than one word together, you and I will both say, fail. Yeah. Okay. Cheesy, but good. Right. All right. So are you ready for this fail? Yeah. Lightning round one word. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. All right. One word to describe your early career. Sleepy. One word to describe where you're currently at in your career. Sleepy. (laughs) One word to describe your future self. Energized. (laughs) One word to describe your favorite boss. Uh, Fail, yeah. (laughs) Fail, yeah. Okay. Uh, Do you need a minute? Think of one word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, African. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. One word. Now, I don't know if you've managed people. I think you might have, or if you've had, you know, let's just say people that you have to, that report into you in some way, shape or form. One word to describe your management style. Uh, Frantic. (laughs) And one word to describe this interview. Fun. All right, cool. You yeah. failed it. Amazing. Yeah. I'm going to give a you a round time. of applause. You nailed it and failed it. All right. So, Josh, first of all, I have to tell you, thank you so much. I adore you. And you know this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yes. And um, we want to know where can we find you? So tell everyone where they can find you on social media. Pitch anything you want, my man. You can find me on Twitter at Josh Johnson or on Instagram at Josh Johnson Comedy because there's a lot of Josh Johnson's. And then um, you can hit me up on my website. Feel free to DM me on all the things because I keep them open for anyone who wants to get in contact. Uh, my website's therealjoshjohnson.com. And then uh, on Facebook, I may have messed this up. I may have done a bad job, but it, it is, on Facebook, I couldn't get the, the backslash to do what I wanted. So on Facebook, it's at Josh J Comedy. So it, And I don't know if anyone goes to it or anyone is using Facebook like that. So it may not matter. But that is how you find me on Facebook if you primarily use Facebook. Oh, well, first of all, thank you. And if if you are now, you know how to find Josh on on the book of face. So there's that. Um, But anything else that you want to share with people? Do you want to tell them about your I like you? Oh, yeah. So I have an album. It's. wherever you listen to things it's called i like you it'll be on spotify itunes title all the things fail yeah my man i'm so proud of you this is crazy you have done so many wonderful things and thank you for being real and vulnerable and sharing some of your failures with us um i'm just giving you a big old hug through the computer and my microphone right now and um i know all everyone who's listening is so grateful for your time so Thank you, Josh Johnson. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, friends. Thanks for tuning in to Failed It. I'm so happy you're along for the ride. And if you enjoyed today's show, head on over to iTunes to rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode. New episodes drop every Wednesday. I'll see you next week, but want to leave you with this thought. What will you fail at today? And how will that help your future successful self? Think about it. I'm proud of you, and you are totally failing it. See you next time.